Hey everybody, welcome to day two of the War of the Spark limited set review on the Mana Lake. I'm John, as always. Today we're going to be taking a look at all of the blue cards from a limited perspective. So we're talking draft, we're talking sealed, we're not talking any other formats. Make sure you watch yesterday's video to get caught up on all of the white cards, as well as some various disclaimers about this set review and what you can expect, etc. But without further ado, we're going to get started with the first card, Ashiox Skulker. Ashiox Skulker is 4 and a blue for a creature nightmare at common. It's a 3-5. Pay 3 and a blue. Ashiox Skulker can't be blocked this turn. I'm not super sold on this. It's pretty overpriced for what it is. It's a 3-5. For five, that's not stats that I'd ever pay for. And if you pay four mana into it every turn, you can get in three damage, which is fine. This reminds me a lot of Frilled uh, Sea Serpent from M19. Of course, it's a little bit less expensive and a little bit weaker. Uh, and I never really enjoyed playing that card either. So I'm not really interested in this uh, unless I'm in kind of that, uh-oh, I didn't get a win condition. I better play this kind of situation. So I've got Ashiok Skulker as like a D plus. It's just not a card that I really want to play. Up next is Augur of Bolas. Augur of Bolas is one and a blue for a creature merfolk wizard and uncommon. It's a 1-3. When Augur of Bolas enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Now I've always liked Augur of Bolas in every set that it's been in, M13 and Modern Masters 2017. And most times it usually just ended up in me putting three cards on the bottom of my library. But here's the thing, taking three cards off the top of your library and putting them on your on the bottom doesn't do anything. This is a, a trick that some people end up falling for in their minds where they get to see those cards and they go, oh no, there goes my bomb, it's gone. But it was a random card that went from the top to the bottom. It was a random card wherever it was. And you knowing what it was doesn't change the fact that it was a random card from the top to the bottom. Knowing what it was just makes you feel bad now and then, but statistically, it didn't matter. So worst case scenario, this is a 1-3 that does literally nothing. Sometimes you're aware that nothing was something, but does nothing. But in this set, blue-red spells, my absolute number one favorite archetype ever, appears to be relatively strongly supported, which means you might be playing blue decks that have more spells than normal, which means Augur of Bolas might have more hits. So in the blue-red spells deck, I think Augur of Bolas is like a C plus. You are hopefully going to be getting something that you're going to be drawing off of this. If you're playing not spells, you're playing blue-black uh, a mass or something, now this goes down to like a C, C minus. You are going to frequently look at the top three cards and put them on the bottom. But in blue-red spells, I think this is a solid C plus. I'm going to continue loving this card, even though I know it's not exactly as good as uh, I like to think it is. So C plus for Augur of Bolas, given that you're playing blue-red spells. Adjust downwards accordingly. Up next is Avon Eternal. Avon Eternal is two and a blue for a creature zombie bird at common. It's a 2-2 flyer. When Avon Eternal enters the battlefield, amass one. This is our first instance that we're seeing of amass, which is the new mechanic for War of the Spark. Amass says, put X plus one plus one counters on an army you control. If you don't control one, create a zero zero black zombie army creature token first. It's worded a little bit weirdly, but basically, the only armies that exist are zombie army tokens. There are no other armies, so you don't have to worry about the fact that it doesn't mention zombie army. And the way it's designed is you are only ever going to have one zombie army. I'm not actually sure if there's any way to make two zombie armies in this format. Of course, if you copy a zombie army, which is a zero zero with counters on it, the counters don't copy, which means you're making a zero zero and it dies. The only way that you're getting multiple army tokens is if you have like an ethereal absolution giving your zero zeros plus one plus one when you copy them. Um, but that's obviously not happening in this format. Maybe there's a weird way to do it, but the takeaway is you're only ever having one army token. So a mass one means make a one one or add one one to your army. So this seems fine. This, this just seems fine. It's a 2-2 two, two for 3 flyer, which is fine. And the bonus 1-1's one, nice. You know, maybe you get a 1-1 one, one creature, which isn't terribly impactful. But a mass is in blue, black, and red. So hopefully you have more a mass. And this is actually making an army bigger. Or you'll be making that 1-1 one, one army bigger later. I think it's a solid C+. I think you'll play every single copy. It's not exactly a high pick. But I think it's a totally fine playable. 
Up next is Bond of Insight. Bond of Insight is three and a blue for a sorcery at Uncommon. Each player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. Return up to two instant and or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand. Exile Bond of Insight. I'm not super interested in this. The milling your opponent is worthless and getting back a couple of instant or sorceries is nice, except you just paid four at sorcery speed to do so, which means you probably spent your turn or a good chunk of your turn. Um, and yeah, I'm just not super sold on this. I'll keep an eye on this because maybe it's just enough value in the blue red spells deck because this is also a spell that you're casting. Um, but the cost is just a little bit high for me. I'm going to start low at a C minus. I'll keep an eye on it. But I just don't think I'm getting the value that I want. Plus, of course, the, uh, the, the common thing that I come back to, this is somewhat random. You don't exactly control if there's going to be two great targets for this in your graveyard or not. You know, turn four, you have this. It's a dead card if you haven't cast anything yet, unless you happen to mill your two cards, but you may just not. So I'm not sold on Bond of Insight. I've got it as C-minus, but I do have it on the watch list. Up next is Callous Dismissal. Callous Dismissal is one in a blue for a sorcery at common. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Amass one. This card is great. I was super worried as the previous season was going on and we just were not seeing cheap bounce. But here it is at common. This kills amass tokens and uh, makes its own. So there's that, I guess. Bounce is great. Cheap bounce is great. Cheap bounce any permanent is great because you can of course bounce your own planeswalker and then replay it to reset its loyalty counters um, this is a card that i want to draft several copies of it is a sorcery speed effect but so is man of war so is any creature that bounces on etb and if you look at this as a two mana one one that bounces a creature that that's fine by me yes instant speed would be better but instant speed would probably be broken in this set with uh tokens being a, a huge part of it plus counters so i think this card's great i think it's a strong b i've seen people talking it down because it's sorcery speed but it's half a mana war i think it's great solid b for callous dismissal up next is Commence the Endgame. Commence the Endgame is four blue blue for an instant at rare. This spell can't be countered, which isn't typically terribly relevant in limited. Draw two cards, then amass X, where X is the number of cards in your hand. So in limited, this is going to be two a lot of the time. This is a six mana spell. If you have a lot more cards in your hand by the time you're casting a six drop, you're probably behind because of screw or flood or something. But still, a six mana two two that draws two. I don't hate that. Sometimes it'll not be a two two. Sometimes it makes your existing army even bigger. And sometimes it'll be three or four power, which is, you know, super good. I think it's a fine first pick. I'd prefer something bombier or, re you know, pure removal than this as my first pick, but I think it is a solid B, uh, especially because of the instant speed. Instantly making an amass token, instantly increasing an, am an amass token, that's gonna be a real big game. Plus, you draw a couple of cards. So I think this is a solid B. Um, I wouldn't get too pie in the sky on this. Don't think that you're just amassing for seven every time, um, but I think even as the edge case of amassing two, I think it's super okay. So B for commence the end game. Contentious Plan is up next. Contentious Plan is one in a blue for a sorcery at common. Proliferate. Draw a card. That's it. it. It does two things. These two things. It proliferates and it draws. Uh, I don't really buy into the whole but it cycles argument on cards. People will frequently say, oh sure, I might not have any counters, but the, this card cycles. And that's not good enough to put a card in your deck. Not these days, anyways. Not these days where you should walk away from a draft with enough playables, typically. Luckily, blue will tend to have counters, either because of a mass uh, army tokens, or because of the blue-green counters deck, or the planeswalkers that you might have. But, it still might not do anything. If this was instant, I might be a little bit more on board, because, of course, instant speed cycling. That's good. That's good. I still wouldn't play a card that just said instant speed draw a card usually. Um, but being sorcery speed, I, I just super duper think this is cuttable. Not really looking to play it unless I know that I will always be flush with counters. If I'm blue green and, you know, 90% of my cards have counters on them, sure. I'll play a card that literally just says proliferate. But beyond that, not a huge fan. So D plus for contentious plan. 
Up next is Crush Descent. Crush Descent is three and a blue for an instant at common. Counter target spell unless its controller pays two. A mass, two. Uh, not a big fan of this one either. Four mana counters are real expensive. Real, real, real expensive. So expensive you often don't play them. And being a conditional counter, your opponent only has to pay two and then this just doesn't happen, really makes this stop being relevant. Getting a 2-2 out of the whole deal isn't really exciting either. As well, you can't cast this unless you have a spell that you're countering. So this doesn't even have the but it cycles argument. You can't just make a 2-2 here. You have to counter a spell in order to make that 2-2. Um, so I'm not really sold on this. I think it's a D minus. I think it's just one of the uh, uh, the bad counter spells. We've had some okay counter spells in the last few sets. I don't think this is one of them. D minus for Crush Descent. Up next is Erratic Visionary. Erratic Visionary is one and a blue for a creature human wizard at common. It's a 1-3. Pay one and a blue, tap it, draw a card, then discard a card. You get to loot. Except, boy, is this not Merfolk Looter. You're, you're, you're paying two mana for something that we used to pay no mana for. Uh, this is probably still okay. If you're going real late game where two mana eventually becomes really easy to spend, uh, you know, this is fine. It's definitely a step down from Merfolk Looter. But it's probably still fine. It's like a C. I might go to C plus here if the tur if the format turns out to be really slow because looting is good. It's just two mana is costly. Uh, uh, you know, at least early in the game. So C plus will say for erratic visionary unless this format turns out to be super fast, which I'm not betting on. Up next is Eternal Sky Lord. Eternal Sky Lord is four and a blue for a creature zombie wizard at uncommon. It's a three three. When Eternal Sky Lord enters the battlefield, a mass two. The zombie tokens you control have flying. Uh, now, of course, the only zombie tokens that you're making are typically going to be the army tokens. There's a couple of other ways, like with Oketra, but you're not just always having a random mythic in your uh, in your deck. So this is a solid zombie army lord to go along with uh, the blue-black one that we'll see later in the week. Five mana is a little bit expensive, but we are technically getting a 5-5. Five, five. Three, three of it is this creature on the ground, and then 2-2 two, two is the army that you're making, which is a 2-2 two, two flyer, or the army that you're increasing by two. Uh, I think the real question is sort of how real is the amass deck? I worry about the amass deck because there is bounce, there is callous dismissal. You might go all in on your zombie army, play several cards to make a six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine zombie army, and your opponent might pay two mana, bounce it, and it's gone. So I'm real hesitant about a mass dot deck. Maybe it's still fine. Maybe it's just going to be so easy to re rebuild that army that it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm a little bit unsure of this rating based on the validity of that deck. But even if this is just a five five with 3-3 three, three on the ground and 2-2 two, two in the air. It, I think it's still fine. I think it's still a solid B. Um, but I am very interested to keep an eye on how the Amass deck works and if it does in fact get blown out or not uh, too regularly. So B for Eternal Skylord. Well, everybody asked for it. This is Fibble Thip the Lost. Fibble Thip the Lost is one in a blue for a legendary creature homunculus at rare. Fibble Thip is a 1 1. When Fibble Thip the Lost enters the battlefield, draw a card. If it entered from your library or was cast from your library, draw two cards instead. When Fibble Thip becomes the target of a spell, shuffle Fibble Thip into its owner's library. So, barring a rare or two in this set, you are not casting or playing this from your library. You're just not. This is one in a blue, one, one, draw one. And that's fine. This card was called Elvish Visionary in green and has always been good in every format it was, that it was in. And in blue, it feels even better. I think blue is going to be very happy with the card draw. Um, that being said, I don't really want Elvish Visionary to be my rare. This is going to feel like a very bad rare to open. This is just like a C plus, um, but a very low pick and a very sad rare to open. Um, the illusion sort of reshuffle ability on this is cute, but I don't know who's really casting spells on Fibblethip. So C plus for Fibblethip. It's good, but it's not the rare that I want. Up next is Finale of Revelation. And if you didn't notice, these are all the hours from Amonkhet. Hour of Revelation, Hour of Glory, etc. 
but color shifted it for finales. Finale of Revelation is X blue blue for a sorcery at Mythic. Draw X cards. If X is 10 or more, it won't be. Instead, shuffle your graveyard into your library, draw X cards, untap up to five lands, and you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. Exile Finale of Revelation. Yada yada yada, as we said yesterday, X is not equaling 10 and limited. It's just not. So this is basically a less good version of all your favorite draw spells. It's a four mana divination. It's Jace's Ingenuity, when you pay X equals three, except it's sorcery speed, instead of instant. Ditto for Opportunity, when you pay X equals four. It's sorcery speed, not instant. It's just, it's not that great being in a sorcery speed spell. I think it's probably like a C minus? I just don't see myself playing this too often. Um, you know, if I could guarantee that I was paying X equals 10, sure, but I'm not ever. So yeah, this is just a worst version of every draw spell we've seen for many, 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 many years. Uh, C minus. C minus for Finale of Revelation. I, I don't think it's all that good. Up next is Flux Channeler. Flux Channeler is two and a blue for a creature human wizard at Uncommon. She's a two, two. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate. Obviously, as I said, blue-red spells is definitely supported in this format, um, but like many of the proliferate spells, this is going to depend on how many things you're potentially proliferating. If you have a bunch of planeswalkers, if you have a bunch of amass tokens, etc., this is also in blue, with blue-green being arguably one of the more countery color pairs, then I think this is going to be really, really solid. Uh, in fact, if you luck out and get a good number of walkers, each walker you cast triggers this. So totally deck dependent, and I think worst case, it's a straight D, sort of last resort creature, uh, an expensive vanilla tutu, but in the right decks, this is going to be way more like a C plus, B minus. Um, so yeah, deck dependent, you're, you, you hopefully should know which decks are going to want this and which decks don't, and that's going to be the decks that uh, are casting spells and proliferating. The one slight potential wrinkle here is if the blue-red spells decks really don't use counters in which case there's a disparity here that's not going to be good. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But this is deck dependent, D, C plus, B minus. You should know where it falls. Time for the next Amonkhet God Zombie. It's God Eternal Kefnet. God Eternal Kefnet is two blue blue for a legendary creature zombie god at Mythic. He's a four five with flying. You may reveal the first card you draw each turn as you draw it. You do get to look at it first. You do get to look at it and decide whether or not you do this. Whenever you reveal an instant or sorcery card this way, copy that card, then you may cast that copy. That copy costs two less to cast. So you flip up, let's say Divination, Divination is in this, in this set, and you look at it and you go, aha, you show your opponent, and you can right then and there, you don't have a chance to you don't keep this card or anything right then and there you can cast a copy of that for two mana less so you could pay a single blue mana for uh, a copy of uh, divination since this is uh, all happening in a trigger this ignores speed so you can cast a sorcery like this at instant speed and then the copy that you drew goes into your hand and of course god eternal kefnet has the god clause when god eternal kefnet dies or is put into exile from the battlefield you may put it into its owner's library third from the top kefnet's great kefnet is super 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 good it's a four five flyer for four that right there is amazing uh you would pick that super highly possibly first pick just super good stats for the cost then it's super hard to deal with but like i said yesterday i really like this window of opportunity here three turns is a long turn it's two turns i guess if you kill it on your turn um but that's that's a window you can potentially get there in that time, but then it's back, and it's still going to be a problem. Uh, anyways, the ability is great if you're blue-red spells, and even if you're not, it's just gravy. Occasionally, you'll get a copied spell that's cheaper. Might not happen very often, but you've got a 4-5 flyer. You're still just going to win. I think God Eternal Kefnet is another slam dunk A+, plus, I think, just because it is a 4-5 flyer for 4. Um, that's super good. I was almost going to drop down to an A there, but no, A+, plus for God Eternal Kefnet. Maybe if you're just like somehow 100% creatures, it's only an A, but still very great card. Up next is Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. Jace, Wielder of Mysteries is one blue, blue, blue for legendary planeswalker Jace at rare. He starts with four loyalty. If you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, you win the game instead. 
Laboratory Maniac. Plus one, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard, draw a card. Minus eight, draw seven cards. Then if your library has no cards in it, you win the game. I've seen a little bit of confusion here. If you only have one card in your library, you still just win the game. You only lose the game by drawing from an empty library during state-based actions, which is checked when you get priority. You don't get priority until this entire ability has resolved, and by the time the ability has resolved, the words are there on the card, you win the game. Uh, yeah, so Jace is bad. Jace is real bad here. Uh, one blue 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 means it's absolutely unsplashable. You cannot splash this card, and it's hard to cast even in a blue deck. Uh, blue 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 is not just something you can absolutely guarantee, and what do you get for it? You get a static ability that doesn't matter. For plus one, you could mill yourself three technically you draw one of those cards i guess you could mill your opponent but that does not seem like part of the plan and then if you get to minus eight which is going to take three turns or so you could draw seven which is still not gonna end the game in fact i just quickly did the, the math after pausing the recording there uh if you cast this on turn four on the draw you plus one four times to get up to minus eight and then you minus eight you've only drawn 31 cards my math might be off there. It might be 35, which means you can't minus eight this right away unless you've been drawing cards some other way. And your opponent now knows your plan. Your opponent knows your plan. They know that all they have to do is kill Jace. And guess what? There's a lot of ways to kill Planeswalkers in this format, not just combat damage. This is way too glass cannony. I never, ever want to try this out. It is just so not what I want to do. Maybe someday on arena where a draft doesn't matter very much and you can maybe do some weird things maybe i'll give it a go once but there's just way too much risk involved here milling yourself milling yourself milling yourself and if jace dies having accomplished literally nothing um so jace is just not how i want to play i don't think i even want to play it just for the plus one like milling my opponent out by two um yeah it's hard to cast it just doesn't have an impact <sighs> People are going to be mad if I give Jace an F, so let's give Jace a D minus. D minus for Jace, Wielder of Mystery, is not a Planeswalker that I really want to play. Up next is Jace's Triumph. Jace's Triumph is two and a blue for a sorcery at Uncommon. Draw two cards. If you control a Jace Planeswalker, draw three cards instead. We just talked about Jace being bad, and I don't ever want to play him. Plus, he's a specific rare. You're just not going to have a specific rare. So Jace's Triumph is Divination. I guess I lied when I said Divination isn't in this format. This is two and a blue sorcery speed, draw two cards. 90% of the time, 95% of the time, 99% of the time. Um, yeah, it's Divination. You know Divination. It's going to be fine if the set is a little bit slow, which it looks like it might be, and you'll play it. If you're blue and you want card draw, it's fine. It's just like a C. It's not a C+, plus, but it's just a C for Divination. Sorry, Chase's Triumph. Up next is a new Planeswalker, Kazmina, Enigmatic Mentor. Kazmina is three and a blue for a legendary Planeswalker, Kazmina, at Uncommon. She starts with five loyalty. Her static ability is spells your opponent's cast that target a creature or Planeswalker you control cost two more to cast. Her minus two is create a 2-2 blue wizard creature token, draw a card, then discard a card. So Kazmina seems quite good. Her static ability isn't amazing. This ability is good but decks in limited don't tend to have that much targeted removal so increasing their cost isn't really a huge deal your opponents will eventually be able to pay that two extra when they really need to use it it's a nice add-on and you're really not paying any extra here for the ability so it's just gravy here it's not great gravy it's you know it's like a, it's like vegetable gravy or something it's not a good beef gravy making a pair of wizards at least and looting twice absolutely awesome uh beware that loot is not a may but of course you generally should always loot anyways kazmina looks absolutely great for just three mana and i'd happily pick her quite highly probably not over removal not over bombs but immediately after that i think kazmina is a strong b and uh after yesterday maybe you were worried that i was going to be down on all the uncommon walkers but nope kazmina is great strong b for kazmina enigmatic mentor Kazmina's Transmutation is up next. Kazmina's Transmutation is one and a blue for an enchantment aura at common. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature loses all abilities and has base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. This is great. 
this is just super solid removal. This is a strong B plus, arguably A minus. Um, it can be removed with enchantment hate, for example, much like Prison Realm, Oblivion Ring, etc. Um, but yeah, I think this is just a, a strong A minus. The creature loses its abilities, so it's not like uh, you know the creature is still activating its abilities or anything. So yeah, strong A minus for Kazmina's Transmutation. It's going to be the first pick in a lot of packs. Uh, yeah, Kazmina knocks it out of the park. Great Planeswalker, great Planeswalker spell. Kiora's Dam Breaker is up next. This is Kiora's spell. We'll see Kiora many, many, many days from now, and she's fantastic. Kiora's Dam Breaker is five and a blue for a creature Leviathan at common. It's a five six. When Kiora's Dam Breaker enters the battlefield, proliferate. Uh, nah, not really interested. It's a five six with no ability other than proliferate for six mana. That's a big dumb creature that just doesn't do enough. This is very, you know, traditional sort of, uh oh, I really desperately need a creature in my deck. I have this one. Uh, D, just don't really play this if you can help it. Uh, there's way cheaper, way better ways of proliferating, and there's way better creatures. So a D for Kiora's Dam Breaker. Up next is Lazatep Plating. Lazatep Plating is one and a blue for an instant at, com at uncommon. A mass one, you and permanence you control gain hexproof until end of turn. This is probably actually really good, and I think it reads a little bit worse than it will be. Ranger's Guile has always been a trick that I've loved, and that gave Hexproof to one target and only end of turn plus one plus one. Getting a permanent one one or a counter on an existing army and giving Hexproof to everything is actually pretty nifty. This is going to be a surprisingly good counter spell. It doesn't say counter anywhere, but it's going to be a, well, it technically says counter in the proliferate reminder text, but it's going to be a really good counter spell, countering removal by giving your creatures uh, hexproof. I think I play this in every single blue deck. The trick here is that I don't think you pick this before the mid pack. It's not that good. There's way better stuff to pick over this, but I think it is a solid C plus. This might be a card that people look at and go, oh, it's a fun little combat trick or something, but it's actually really good. Uh, C plus for Lazatep plating. Up next is Naga Eternal. Naga Eternal is two and a blue for a creature zombie Naga at common. It's a three two. That's it. It's got some flavor text. Uh, yeah, it's a three two for three. It's the vanilla filler. You need a creature. Here you go. There's better stuff to play. If you didn't get all that better stuff here, it's a C. There's not much else to say about this. Just a C for Naga Eternal. Up next is our next on Common Planeswalker, Narset, Parter of Veils. Narset, Parter of Veils is one blue-blue for a legendary Planeswalker, Narset, at Uncommon. She starts with five loyalty. Each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. Her minus ability is minus two. Look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a non-creature, non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Well, we're back to Planeswalkers that I'm not super excited by, but I don't think you're putting Narset in your sideboard. Narset seems fine, just not really bonkers. The static ability is flavor text a lot of the time. Yeah, there's Jace's Triumph, and there is going to be some card draw stuff, but generally, it's just not going to be really all that good. Her ability is fine, her minus ability, but non-creature is a little bit rough. If you're playing blue-red spells, you're presumably going to have a lot more hits and she's going to go way up in value. But really, I think this is just like a C plus. In spells, it might be a B minus. I think I always play her just because, you know, it's free quote on quote card draw maybe um, and if you are blue red spells as I said she's going to be great as a B minus so yeah Narset I think is an always include she's just going to be not terribly exciting if you're not in blue red spells so C plus for Narset Parter of Veils up next is Narset's Reversal. Narset's Reversal is blue blue for an instant at rare. Copy target instant or sorcery spell, then return it to its owner's hand. You may choose new targets for the copy. I've never really liked this effect in limited, um, you know, explorer expansion, I believe you could copy sort of a spell. And uh, we've had, uh, I believe red red or blue blue or both red red and blue blue versions of this spell sort of where you redirect a spell or you copy a spell or whatever. Um, the, the remand kind of soft counter bounce it back to hand is kind of interesting if you're sort of countering an opponent's spell for a turn at least. Um, but while it's an interesting wrinkle to it, I'm just not sold about this card. Copying your own spell always sounds great, but it never really gets there in limited. And copying your opponent's spell is a complete crapshoot as to 
what they might have and when they might have it and if your blue blue spell is actually relevant or not uh, big meh for me here not excited i've got it at a d minus i just don't really want to play narset's reversal um, newer players tend to look at this and go aha i'm copying stuff i'm you know it's a way that i'm cheating at magic basically it's it's a must be powerful and it's just just not d minus for narset's reversal up next is No Escape. No Escape is two and a blue for an instant, a common counter target creature or planeswalker spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. Scry one. It's a counter spell. It's an essence scatter that costs three mana instead of two, and that's probably still okay. Getting to hit some planeswalkers as well seems fine. It's just a totally okay counter spell which means it's like a c c for counter spell um you know as long as the format's not super duper aggressive as long as your deck is a little bit controlling you know you have plans to pass the turn holding up mana hopefully you can do other stuff with it a mana sink or a draw spell or something if you don't get a good counter uh, but yeah this is just an okay counter spell so solid c for no escape um huge bonus it kills the gods which is great up next is Relentless Advance. Relentless Advance is three and a blue for a sorcery at common, a mass three. That's it, no bonus, just a mass three. So I'm not super interested in this. It's a four mana three three, which is a very filler creature. Like you really don't want to be playing a, three, a four mana three three. Um, maybe this card is a four mana sorcery that puts three counters on one very specific creature. Still, not super interested maybe the amass deck wants this uh, again the amass deck is i think a real big question mark for me whether it's going to be really good or whether it's just going to be so glass cannony that it's not good enough so i've got this at a d i just don't think i ever want to play this unless i'm desperate for a creature but we'll see what the amass deck turns out to look like Rescuer Sphinx is up next. Rescuer Sphinx is two blue blue for a creature Sphinx at Uncommon. It's a 3-2 flyer. As Rescuer Sphinx enters the battlefield, you may return a non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. If you do, Rescuer Sphinx enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. This is pretty cool. This is a snapping drake that, if I can bounce a creature, is a 4-3 flyer instead. Cool. Obviously paired with re-triggering an ETB effect, it gets even better. Um, but even with zero ways to abuse this, I think it's a solid C+. Probably not a B-, minus, but a 4-3 flyer for 4 is still very, very good. If you do have those uh, uh, ETB effects to re-trigger, it's going to be great. As well, this does say non-land permanent. You could bounce a Planeswalker that has used up its usefulness and then recast it. Um, yeah, this is solid. I think it's just a B minus. It's real good. Real, real good. Silent Submersible is up next. Silent Submersible is blue blue for an artifact vehicle at rare. It's a 2 3. Whenever Silent Submersible deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, draw a card. Crew 2. Why a submarine doesn't have unblockable or something is beyond me. This is a massive flavor fail but whatever a two three for two crew two i'm never playing that but if you can hit which is where the unblockable would come in uh then the card draw ability is great but i i'm just not sure if i see this hitting like you're casting this on two i i guess hopefully your three drop can crew it and hopefully they don't have a two toughness or i guess three toughness creature um yeah i don't know I don't know. I want to give it an F for the flavor fail here. Realistically, I think it's like a C, C plus. Um, but yeah, without evasion, I just don't know how often this is hitting. Now, of course, you do have the snowball value here where if your opponent can't block, if they don't have a blocker for this, you're going to just draw cards, which is just going to put you more and more and more ahead. Um, but yeah, I think this is like a C, C plus. I feel like it could have been better, especially as a rare C plus, we'll say for Silent Submarine. Up next is Sky Theater Strix. Sky Theater Strix is one in a blue for a creature bird at common. It's a 1-2 flyer. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Sky Theater Strix gets plus one plus zero until end of turn. I have a history with 1-2 flyers for two and underrating them, and I don't do that anymore. Luckily, this one already tells me that it's pretty darn good if you are in the, uh, in the Spells Matters deck which, as I've talked about and will continue to talk about, is supported in this set, unlike M19, where they just kind of teased us and said, yeah, this is what those colors do, and then it 
didn't. Uh, yeah, this is great. It's a 1-2 for 2 flyer, which is going to get in for some damage. And if you cast a non-creature spell, you're getting in for 2. A 2-2 two, two flyer for 2 is a card that I would absolutely adore. And if this is a 2-2 two, two for 2 the majority of the time, it's going to be great. If you can double spell, make it a 3-2, heck, hit it with a combat trick. Make it like a 4-2. It's going to be great. Uh, every single blue deck is probably going to be fine with this as like a C maybe a C plus, but if you are blue red spells, this is going to be a strong C plus, maybe even into the B minus territory. Up next is Spark Double. Spark Double is three and a blue for a zero zero creature illusion at rare. You may have Spark Double enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature or planeswalker you control, except it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it if it's a creature. It enters with an additional loyalty counter on it if it's a planeswalker, and it isn't legendary if that permanent is legendary. Uh, so I guess here is a way for you to make a zombie army token that survives. But I wouldn't advise it. There are hopefully better targets for you. Uh, but yeah, clones that only clone your own things are nowhere near as good as traditional clones used to be, where you could clone anything on the battlefield. Firstly, this card is flat out only as good as your deck is. If your deck is great, this card's great. If your deck's not great, this card's not great. And secondly, this does not stabilize you if you're behind. In fact, it could be unplayable if you don't have a board state. Now, if your deck is great, this is just another copy of every solid card in your deck. So, you know, the real variable here is your deck. This is going to range anywhere from like a C plus if your deck is a C plus to a B plus if your deck is a B plus. Um, you know, be aware, like I said, it only copies your own things. But yeah, you do you. If you have a bunch of bombs, this card's great. If you don't, it's still fine, but it's not great. So C plus to B plus, grade it based on your deck. Up next is Spellkeeper Weird. Spellkeeper Weird is two and a blue for a creature weird at common. It's a one four. You can pay two and tap it and sacrifice it. Return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. This seems quite decent. Uh, a one four for three will block well and not attack. But the thing's entire purpose is to help you live for a bit until you need to return some key piece of removal for something. For only two mana, at instant speed. If I'm in the control deck, or especially the blue-red spells deck, I definitely want one of these, maybe two of these. In an average blue deck, this is probably still slightly okay as an annoying blocker, but maybe a little bit more cuddable in an average blue deck. So kind of like C, C+, depending on which deck you happen to be in. Stealth Mission is up next. Stealth Mission is two and a blue for a sorcery at common. Put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. That creature can't be blocked this turn. This is probably just fine, I think. Counters are nice since they'll stick around, but this is basically just an aura that says plus two plus two and can't be blocked once. That's still pretty unimpactful though. It will still just end games sometimes. Probably fine like a C plus. This is one of those cards that you know, someone's going to lose to on Arena once, and suddenly, you know, they're going to be playing like five copies of it, and everyone's going to be drafting it because they lost to it that one time. Uh, keep in mind, this does a whole lot less if it's not ending the game, but if it's ending the game, it's ending the game. So, hard spell to talk about because people definitely are going to be results oriented thinking about it, but I think it's a C. Plus. I think it's fine. I think I typically play it. Um, if I'm not really a creature deck, if I'm being very controlling, well, you obviously don't play it there, but I think we can go with a C plus on Stealth Mission. And I think it might be one of the grown test cards at the end of the format. Up next is Tamio's Epiphany. Tamio's Epiphany is three and a blue for a sorcery at common. Scry four, then draw two cards. This isn't awful. Uh, scrying four is a whole lot of scrying, and it is scry four, unlike Silhana Wayfinder. And paying four mana for a divination isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, I think this is probably fine, assuming the format doesn't happen to be super fast. I think it's like a solid C plus mid to late pack uh, pickup. Your, your control decks are going to be relatively fine with this. So C plus for Tamio's Epiphany. Teferi's Time Twist is up next. Teferi's Time Twist is one in a blue for an instant at common. Exile target permanent you control. Return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. If it enters the battlefield as a creature, it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. 
So like previous blink spells, this really depends to an extent on how good your ETB effects are. The more you have, the more playable this becomes. Getting the counter is nice because it means that you don't have to be abusing an ETB effect to get some real value out of this. And you could flicker your walkers to reset them. So there is some versatility to this. I'll probably have to play with this to determine if it's just playable or just not playable because I think it's very much on that line. So let's go with an optimistic C here for, Tef for Teferi's Time Twist. Um, but if you really just don't have ways to abuse it, you maybe cut it. So C for Teferi's Time Twist. Thunder Drake is up next. Thunder Drake is three and a blue for a creature elemental Drake at common. It's a two, three with flying. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Thunder Drake. I think this is probably a solid blue red spells payoff. Maybe a two, three flyer for four is fine-ish. It's fine-ish, but less ideal than a 3-2. Getting a single counter on this, though, and everything's solid. Everything's great. I think you only need that first counter for this card to be fine. Uh, getting any additional counters is going to be great, but I would question how often you're going to be doing that. Double spelling is one of the better things you can do in Magic in Limited, but you can't do it forever because you're only drawing one card a turn typically. So I'm not sold that you're gonna be putting, you know, three, four, five, six, seven counters on this, but as long as you can get the first one on, I think this card's solid. So I think this is a C plus. Um, it could even be a B minus if you are in blue red spells and you th are pretty sure you're gonna cast a couple instant sorceries every turn or two or three. Um, but let's go with a C plus for Thunder Drake. Totally Lost is up next, a reprint from uh, a few sets here, Return to Ravnica being the original. Four and a blue for an instant at common, put target non-land permanent on top of its owner's library. Uh, it's expensive, but the effect is good, especially at instant speed. You know, we saw this in RTR, we saw it in uh, M19, and it was totally fine. And I played it a lot. Now in M19, it was a little bit less fine because that format was fast and dominated by red-white aggro. So, you know, we can kind of see how this expensive five mana spell goes, depending on format. That being said, I think this format is going to be slow, which means I think this card is going to be very, very playable. Much like uh, um, Callus Dismissal, Callus Dismissal that I talked about earlier today, uh, it absolutely murders amassed armies, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be fine. I think it's a C plus. Um, I, I don't think I'll go to the B minus just because, like I said, five mana is a lot, uh, but C plus for totally lost. Our final spell for today is Wall of Runes. Wall of Runes is a single blue mana for a creature wall at common. It's an 0-4 with defender. When Wall of Runes enters the battlefield, scry one. No interest. It's an 0-4, which isn't quite strong enough to uh, withstand a lot in this set um it'll it'll hang out for a little bit but it's no wall of mist scrying one not a big enough bonus for me i never want to play this except maybe out of the sideboard when i desperately need to not die really 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 fast maybe in a super controlling deck i realize that i have no way of getting to the late game and maybe there i play it but this is really a, a really a d card it's a card that you really shouldn't play uh outside of certain situations so d for wall of runes so that's gonna wrap it up for blue blue's got a lot of uh, uh good cards not a ton of like out of the park hits other than kefnet and i guess kazmina's transmutation but a lot of bees there's a lot of bees in here um, so i'm really excited to play blue like i said blue red spells is one of my favorite archetypes in every format that it's actually supported m19 i'm looking at you not actually supporting it um yeah so i'm super excited to play blue i, I really want to see how a mass plays out i really want to see if going all in on a mass token is a recipe for disaster or not have a feeling it might be but we'll see um so yeah let me know what you think of blue what you're excited for what you uh, agree with what you disagree with etc in the comments down below as always if you have any questions comments or suggestions you can find me over on twitter twitch and facebook at the mana leak you can find me over at patreon.com slash the mana leak if you want to become a backer uh if you become a backer at the five dollar level or above each month uh you're entered to get all the cards out of the cracker packs that i do uh every tuesday i crack physical packs of cards we'll be starting war of the spark the week after pre-release um so yeah check that out
You can go over to inkedgaming.com and use the promo code MANALEAK10, all one word, one zero as the number to get 10% off your order and help out the channel. Uh, you can help out the channel simply by clicking thumbs up and clicking subscribe if you like the content and you want to see more. If you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, though, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow for the Black Set Review.